Hello, welcome to Fiber Trek. My name is Sarah. Welcome, you are most welcome to my little neck of the woods up here in northern Maine. I have quite a little bit to share with you, which is going to cross a lot of different skills and mediums from weaving to some eco printing experimentation and culminating in experimenting with some encaustic wax collage. I have a book that I would like to share with you. But mostly I want to offer a deep heartfelt thanks for spending some time with me and for those that invest financially, it is much appreciated, encouraging, and humbling. There will be knitting. I'm looking forward to catching up. Let's get started. So Rob and I had kind of a do or die moment this summer. I've owned a floral loom for 15 years and I've woven on it a little bit very early on when I moved to Millinocket and then it got put away in a garage and we needed to decide if we were going to keep it or get rid of it. And so many of my weaving friends encouraged me to move it into the house and weave on it. And I was very lucky that my dear wool friend, Patty, who I've known for a very long time, offered to come up for a fabulous weekend, which was supposed to be sunny with campfires and swimming, but ended up being rainy and cozy <laughs> inside, which worked out well. She offered to come up and help me plan the project and warp the loom. That was a real stumbling block for me. I just felt like I had so many things I needed to look up and research and it was really helpful to have her come up and be like yeah we're gonna do this we wanted to be able to use the icelandic yarn that had come back from the mill that was very densely woven or spun and really wasn't working out as knitting material i wanted a way to use that up that would be productive and um, beautiful so we decided to warp the loom which is a 40 two inch Leclerc loom, uh, four harness loom. Um, we decided to warp that to do rugs. And so I had carpet warp left over from like, I don't know, 10 years ago when Rob and I had aspired to do this. And so we were able to do all the calculations. I found that to be so helpful, even though I had the book. And a lot of times I do use a book and YouTube videos to kind of self-teach, but in this particular instance, Patty's help really made all of the difference. So we got the reed slayed, and now I need to put all of the ends through the heddles and tie it to the beam, which I now have the least sticks to do to keep it the tension correct. So stay tuned for what will happen next. to share with you a book I came across after doing some research on YouTube and eco printing. This book, Best of Both Worlds by Jane Dunwald, features a number of different techniques for botanical printing, eco printing, um, and using different mordants and dye enhancements, modifiers. I found the book really concise and helpful set up to take a beginner right through all of the steps, equipment, different vocabulary, and result possibilities. I had a bunch of leftover mordanton paper from a workshop I did 
in the Wool Scouts series that I offered. And so I decided to just fool around with that. And some of the results I wasn't that thrilled about. I had thrown it in a pot of boiling water. And that's what kind of led me to do a little bit further research and then eventually to Jane's work. She has another book and video as well, which features using a heat press uh, versus steam or water, boiling water and um, rolling. And I found that really magical. So she has the best of both worlds. She also has art cloth, which was really interesting. And then she does have a book, Collaborate Mother Nature, which talks about heat press and botanicals. I am excited to share with you where her work took me. So I did some experimenting earlier this summer, and then once I received the books and had watched a couple videos, more experimentation ensued. I had gathered some other elements for natural dyeing, and I was able to pull a lot of that together to make this process fairly easy. I had a bunch of items that I had gathered for the shibori dyeing and the indigo dyeing, and I hit up my husband Rob for other pieces that I would need to make these eco printing steam packs. So I'm going to use steam versus putting my whole pack in simmering water, which I had done before. And I also need to mordant my paper. So in preparing my pack per the book and recommendation, I am using alum because I had it on hand, although she talks about the two different types of alum especially if you're using cellulose fiber, which I am. And I'm also using cardstock, kind of like a blanket. Um, you can gain different colors and resist this way. Uh, she has a lot of different process and um, experiments and um, techniques that she recommends in the book. For modifiers, I'm using walnut dye and white vinegar. And I also threw in some old book pages just to see how it took uh, the tannins in the plants and how it stood up to all of the moisture in the steam. So I am using wax paper or parchment paper for a barrier. I didn't want there to be prints on both sides of my paper, partly because when I use this in collage, I don't wanna to have to decide if there's two great prints, which one to use, and or I don't want that print on the opposing side to show through if I'm using wax or other medium that might thin the paper. So once I had built the packs um, between this, I'm using aluminum plates here, I just put the binder clips on and she really talks about three key elements, which is um, the pressure, the heat, which are the two that I remember right now. It's rather late. And I think um, the mordant. So those three things kind of need to work together. So the binders go on and luckily my neighbor had given me this brand new steamer pot um, and I was able to utilize that. So in it goes for just about two hours in the steam. And what do you do while you're steaming for two hours? Well, you go and you make more packs so that you can utilize the energy that's already in the steamer. So 
Um, I did quite a bit of printing as you'll see, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you the reveal and what I did with it. So one of the reasons I've been really inspired to do a lot of the surface design experimentation is because I am starting to explore the use of encaustic wax as part of my collage. And here's a little peek at my process. You can see I've used a number of the eco print elements. I've got some cyanotype work happening and also, I mean, pieces of packaging. I really love collage and I've talked about that before. And caustic wax came into the picture when Ivana from the Republic of Me vlog, which I would encourage you to check out. She talks um, about travel and fiber and other art. Um, she really put this into the forefront of my experimentation and adventuring in the art world. I have found these 19th century French letters and calligraphy. They add such beautiful text elements and it's just been fun to work with different types of paper and the way the wax interacts with all these different materials. So you can see I have birch bark here, I've got watercolor paper, 
I'm going to be pulling in those old letters and uh, book leaves. And so it's a real opportunity to use a lot of different mediums. So encaustic wax can be used for painting, collage, all sorts of things. And for me, I like finishing my pieces with that surface. Encaustic wax is a combination of beeswax and resin from a tree. And so let's go take a look at how we finish these elements using the wax. If you're a patron, you would have seen earlier in the summer my experimentation with this medium, and I really became inspired through technique with Sherry Rapogel on YouTube, and I also purchased her workshop um, in Costecology 101 from her site. So I have a little bit of knowledge. I ordered a book um, called Encaustic Collage by Diana Wolf or the Encaustic Studio. And so I am self-taught, and this is merely an invitation to explore other elements and mediums of working with imagery and color and fiber. Um, collage really uh, lends itself, especially with encaustic, to embedding texture. And so I'm looking forward to experimenting with that. And as I mentioned, this liquid piece is uh, resin from a tree and beeswax, and when it dries, um, you get kind of a soft ethereal look, which will be very different than the cold wax. You can scrape it, you can create texture, you can add lines, it can be very sculptural. And so I am definitely in the learning stages and by no means this is a tutorial. And I would encourage you to seek out some of those references um, I highlighted if you're interested in learning more. Um, the cold wax might be an interesting entry point if you want to work with wax. This is a little bit different makeup. You're not working with anything um, hot. You just really need the wax and kind of a scraper that leaves a very different finish, but you can still collage with it. It takes longer to dry. Um, in this particular piece, I am back experimenting with those vintage letters, and I'm also using gold leaf. Um, I am, as you know, very attracted to metallics in my work. And so between the gold leaf and also using some oil pigment sticks um, to kind of enhance some of the turmeric dyeing in this cyanotype that came up, but also um, just to create more depth. So the oil pigment sticks, again, um, are another way to engage with color without having to heat up paint and have that kind of encaustic surface. So um, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm just not feeling there's enough time, but here is a little look at the finished pieces. Um, and again, if you don't like it, you can scrape it back. Um, I look forward to sharing more about this experiment with you. Hello and welcome to the fiber portion of this episode. We have quite a few things to talk about, including another finished item. I will say that 
I was pretty smug in my last edition and I'm starting to feel the pressure of um, finishing and knitting. Um, I had all these great kind of, you know, hopes and dreams. I was a font of projects and now I'm like, I'm never going to make it, but we'll see what happens. Um, I am excited to share with you what has been um, going on in my knitting as well as some purchases. Um, mostly I want to make sure I take a moment to thank you for being here and participating in this project. I say this each episode, at least I hope I do, um, that I find uh, it humbling and encouraging um, the comments, the insights, and especially the financial contributions of the patrons. Um, it is really motivating and um, to help me continue to endeavor to find new ways of shooting and also new um, creative uh, experiments to try. So eloquent, articulate, concise? No, but deeply heartfelt. So thank you so much. Right. So I recorded this actually outside and um, the hairy woodpecker has arrived. You might be hearing some ambient noise from the porch, which is where the bird feeders are. And I recorded on the porch yesterday and it was beautiful and sunny and the birds were flitting around me. Um, but there was a chipmunk who during like the first 10 minutes was going bananas with a high pitched chirp. And as I watched and edited, I was like, I cannot leave that in there. <laughs> so everybody's happier. I'm inside. They're able to access their seed. And we're going to hopefully be able to come to a mutual understanding with sound. So we've really been enjoying the wildlife sightings. This is a big migratory part of the year here for us. Um, a lot of the ducks, um, loons, and other kind of um, divers and lake birds um, are headed south or to the ocean, to the coast. Um, and of course, all of the songbirds are going to be migrating as well. So we've been looking out for other species. Um, we've had a flicker here, a northern flicker here at our suet feeders, which um, I think maybe it's only happened one other time. So it's really beautiful to see them up close. They're real golden color, really beautiful bird. I digress. What were we going to talk about? I think it was wool and finished items. So let's do it. If you've been following along, you know I've been working on Melody Hoffman's Moonlight Meadow Sweater. I'm like, Moonlight Magic Shawl, and that's not it. It's the Moonlight Meadow Sweater. And I've been knitting this in a Navajo churro, which I purchased from One Lupin many years ago. And um, I paired that for the color um, texture and color work components of this with snow-capped yarns from the Netloft, and that is from the hand dyer Shelly um, Kosin. I'm not sure I'm saying that right, and I'm not sure that she's still dying, but you can certainly check out their website um, if you're interested in her um, colors. Um, the base for those particular yarns, I think one was a BFL and one was a BFL silk. Um, and so I am using, like, at least I know I'm using the sedge, which is the beautiful green in this. And then I don't know the name of the coppery kind of spice color. So that is finished. Um, I made no modifications to the body construction. I followed her pattern. But to the sleeves, which I typically do, I amended the shaping so I pushed it further down towards the elbow. I did less decreases because I don't like tight sleeves. Um, I like to be able to push them up and get, you know, shirts underneath them. So those are the modifications. I kind of made it up as I went. Um, but overall it turned out great. I've got lots of room. Um, it's a little bit on the warm side today so I haven't had it on um, but I'm sure there'll be moments where you will see me in it. Um, I can't remember the size I met, knit. I think it was the third size. My gauge was off just a little bit. One of the nice things about knitting top-down construction, which I'm going to talk about, is I will often just cast on and then take my gauge 
um, and then amend from there. So if I've cast on for the third size but I'm not getting gauge, I'll just make sure that I increase to the next size up or the next size down. I did this with my Lovage and my Bressa uh, by Marie Wallen in the middle of the sweater and so I like the flexibility of kind of casting on and then um, utilizing the numbers in the pattern to tweak um, the fit um, around the yoke. So that's finished and um, I'm, I'm really happy with the pattern and the way it turned out um, overall and the way the yarn performed. So I did give it a nice wet block. Uh, I didn't stretch or, any, or anything. I just got it wet and laid it out and um, made sure that everything could relax, um, especially on the inside floats, which I'm not a float catcher. Um, I will take things far um, and uh, so I wanted everything to kind of relax and settle in. Um, and yeah, so that's finished. And that was inspiring as if you are a patron, you would have seen my Soulful Stash dream session of what could come next. Um, so I had a lot of fun in that kind of moment, you know, when we come out of a finished project and we're looking and thinking and, you know, looking at yarns and what we want to work with and colors, etc. So, um, So I've been in that state uh, since I finished this. <laughs> but wait till you see what I ended up picking up. <laughs> there was a lots of dreaming. Um, in the meantime, you'll know I've, I'll have finished the Puzzle Shawl by Sophia Camelborn, um, and I had cast on the Kairuna um, by, um, yep, uh, the name was right on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember what it is. So it will be listed um, on, the on the blog site, fibertrek.wordpress.com. I make a list of all of the items I talk about um, so that you can reference that for your um, searches. So I am knitting the Kairuna. I was um, inspired by Loretta and Natalia of Knit My Way Home podcast, and I cast on in Tidal Yarns. Um, she is a natural dyer out of Connecticut, and her fleeces uh, primarily are procured from the Northeast and spun here in the Northeast of the United States. And one thing I'm finding about this particular yarn is it's really spongy and cushiony. It's got a lot of structure to it. And so the original shawl was knit in a lace and llama blend. And that has a lot of drape. That particular fiber does not have a lot of memory um, or structure. So you get a lot of beautiful drape to it. Um, this is not, that is not descriptive of this particular yarn. So I am continuing to do the increases as noted. I'm uncertain if I will make gauge. I've gone up two needle sizes. I'm working on a US 6 and I think the recommended needle is a US 4. So I've gone up a couple needle sizes to try to create some loft or space or drape. Um, and I'm currently, um, more than two-thirds of my way through the increases for the garter stitch portion. So we'll have to just see in the picture, it's a big drapey shawl and I'm like, is this just gonna be like around my neck? So it's finished with a lace um, component, um, which again, I may need to go up another needle size to kind of create the openness in those stitches. I'm really loving the color of this though. It's a very moody, earthy, kind of fall, um, blue, green, um, and I believe this is an over-dyed um, gray yarn, so with indigo perhaps. Anyway, I'm thoroughly enjoying that. It's really great for traveling. I don't have to think too much about charts, etc. when I'm at my parents or after a long day at work. Um, the beginning of school is always crazy and this year is um, in no exception. I've had a number of evaluations that are due right off the bat. and. Sometimes that stresses me out finding the time to do that. So when I come home, I'm feeling a little bit in, uh, overwhelmed and uh, shock. And this is a great way to kind of transition into the evening. So what did I cast on or continue on for my next sweater project? I had lots of dreams. And uh, like I said, those of you who saw that video are probably like, oh, but ultimately, I went back to one I had ripped out and cast back on, and that's the J Sweater by Rachel Brockman for Universal Yarns. This is a free pattern on Ravelry, and I am knitting it in um, some yarn I brought back from Norway. Um, 
the spell so and I will um, leave a like I said a reference to that um, I don't have the label handy um, oh actually I do hold on it's right here Wow um, it's the Gamel Norsk spell sow, which is a sheep native to Norway and this is from oh Ah, Holmgard and she is on Instagram and I believe you can reach out to her regarding this particular yarn if you're interested anyway I will leave some of that information again in the reference points in the blog um, so yeah I had like oh I'm gonna use this and I'm gonna use that ultimately I came back to this beautiful earthy brown and um, one of the things that again I'm this is a top-down construction and I had cast this on and ripped it out because my gauge was off significantly and so um, in doing that I opted to uh, cast on a seed stitch collar which is preferred for me and um, yeah, so right now I am following as charted in the pattern, and um, it has a rather shallow um, color work design on the yoke, which I kind of like. So again, you'll have an opportunity once those increases are done to kind of play around and tweak the gauge a little bit. So that's on the go, and I'm basically halfway done with the color work chart, and then it's just brown knitting. I know, you're looking forward to that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm spying some of my other projects that are hanging out. One is a cowl I've been working on, um, the Trondheim Cowl by Sophia Camaborn, which I think deserves a little pickup. And I have been thinking about the Upton Yarns um, three-ply DK that I spoke about um, in another video uh, for a cowl versus a sweater. So originally I thought I would cast on with that, but I don't really have enough yardage, and so I spent a lot of time researching um, cowls because I wear a lot of neckwear. I, I, it's actually one of my favorite things um, to wear in the winter is a um, bolster for the um, uh, for my neck. So um, yeah, so more to come on that. But in the meantime, the J sweater is on the go. So I had a little haul and I was inspired again by Loretta and Natalia of Knit My Way Home. There's been a lot of talk regarding a new Tiden yarn um, and I wanted to kind of you know, explore that, explore some colors and that's going to feel a little bit like what when you see the colors I purchased. Mostly I was inspired by the sweater uh, Roots and Shoots and I think it's Taddy Lusk. I'm not sure. I have a couple of her patterns in my um, favorites and this one came up and it is knit with an unspun yarn like Plotolope or um, Nutiden and it's held with a uh, silk mohair and so when my friend Nicole forwarded to me the Knitting Olive site with all of their beautiful range of silk mohair I was really smitten and I wanted to work with that um, pair so I went to the uh, Nutiden site and um, they are a mill in Sweden and they do source um, their wool from Swedish um, sheep and it has a range of textures because you know the fleeces are not uniform and consistent so um, I bought enough of each color I think I bought 600 grams of one and 300 of another which um, you can do fairly well for this particular pattern I think you needed two plates or 200 grams or maybe it was 300 grams of the new Tiden and then corresponding mohair silk so I picked up this color, um, which is, I'm not sure if it, the light's going to do it justice, but it's kind of a light, eggy spice. Um, I don't know, that's not a very nice description, is it? But it's got kind of yellow and rose in it, but it's also kind of creamy with some um, warm brown. So it's a very warm color. This would be the main color of the sweater. And then I purchased I know you're like what are you talking about color anyway um, I know it is a color but it's not it's not um, out of my nat natural wheelhouse um, 
so then I purchased this kind of chocolate, you know, um, brown, coffee brown. It's not super dark. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to use that as the contrast or if I have, um, I have upstairs an even deeper, peatier, earthier brown that I was gifted from a friend um, for the contrast. So the jury's out, but I was inspired by that sweater. It looked um, fun. It's something new for me to kind of pull that mohair silk in. I don't really get that excited about it because, um, I don't know, I'm always thinking a little bit more about the origin small farm, minimally processed, and so it was just kind of fun to branch out and think a little bit about it and be inspired by all of those beautiful colors and the possibilities. So I'm excited to work with it and try this out. I've never paired those two. I may hate it, so we'll see. And um, yeah, so that kind of came my way uh, this month, and it was exciting to receive a package from Sweden. Right, I think we've covered quite a bit here. Um, I know that you've been uh, seeing a couple of these projects for a while and um, yeah, here's hoping <laughs> through the next part of the month, which is going to be exceptionally busy, um, there will be some progress to report next at the end of the month in September. I'm looking forward to hosting my mom at the end of this month to talk about her contrast, her contrast, her um, cross-stitching, uh, uh, adventures <laughs> and um, yeah so in the meantime may you be well many blessings to you and yours and I look forward to sharing with you what's been happening on the next episode take care <laughs>